We're going to hear next from Dan Robinson. Dan returned to the department in 2011 after spending two years at McDowell Group, an Alaska economic consulting firm, and before that worked as a statewide economist for the Department of Labor for eight years. His work experiences included time at a Washington, D.C. energy consulting firm, a New York City law firm, and the Alaska Attorney General's Office in Anchorage and Juneau. Please welcome Dan Robinson. Thank you. Um, you're going to be delighted to hear that after a full day of numbers, uh, you're going to hear from somebody whose professional purpose is to produce numbers, right? So if you're not number fatigued yet, then um, I'm not going to number fatigue you because I'm usually, uh, I'm not going to talk as much about numbers as I usually would. Our shop produces uh, with the federal government many of the economic statistics that tell us how we're doing broadly as an economy. So the number of jobs we have, uh, unemployment rates, population, wages. Um, so we, we have a lot of familiarity with that data. And that data is usually how we decide if we're in a recession or not, how we're doing. And we've seen some reference to those numbers. They're not the only ones, but they're some of the key ones. So what that, that gives us at the Department of Labor is, is, I think, some understanding over time what moves those numbers. It's far from perfect, and that's going to be my first point. And let's just start with um, numbers, yay. Um, 736,000 people in Alaska. Uh, there are three states with fewer people. Um, I'm going to name two and see who can yell out the third one fastest. Wyoming, Vermont, North Dakota. What a smart audience. So $37 billion in personal income. Not all of that income is from uh, wage earnings, but the biggest chunk of it is. The other pieces are transfer payments, and then dividends, rents, and income. And then $60 billion in uh, gross domestic product. That's, that's the value that we produce in Alaska, the value of the goods and services that we produce. Um, so my main point in starting there is to say our economy, every economy of that size and, and significantly smaller, are far too complicated to know with any precision what happens when you push here or create a new tax there. If somebody tells you, uh, if you do this, that will happen, then be suspicious. Because um, I was thinking earlier in one of the conversations that there's a part of this exercise that involves spreadsheets. And that's an important part. And I'm fascinated by the model exercise. And I, I hope you're as interested as I am to, to play with some of those numbers. But um, our numbers, as, an, as economists, are a little different than accountants' numbers because our numbers tend to wander off sometimes. Sometimes they lose confidence, right? They stop doing what normally numbers do. Sometimes they even change their value. Show me a CPA who has to deal with numbers that changes its values. They, they don't, right? So our numbers are, are fuzzy and our, our numbers aren't fuzzy. The, the impact of changes to an economy are fuzzy. But, but some key economic concepts to keep in mind as you think about not the, not the political viability, not the fairness, that's, that's a conversation for another day, but primarily the economics of, of the, the likely effect of some of these things. So let's jump right into this concept of new money. You, you, that, I think this, is, this will be intuitive if you're not already familiar with the concept. There's a certain amount of money circulated in our economy. Uh, and some of the options we'll discuss will tap into new sources. Others will move money around, um, maybe to great effect. But, but that's, that's a, a key concept to keep in mind. This new money, um, I added this slide, this, this slide kind of late in the game. Be careful not to associate that with free money. Because as I said there, if, if we, and, and I think there's some risk of this. If we go through complicated contortions to get the money from somebody else, then we risk creating uncertainty in the form of, of lawsuits. We're a state, not a country. There's a limit to what we can do. Um, and then also, uh, economics, to a lot of degrees, is a, is a study of incentives. And uh, we, when we 
raise taxes, we change the, the incentives for things so we can, we can uh, cut up our nose to spite our face by trying to get somebody else to, to pay all of our way. Uh, multiplier effects, usually you hear this in the concept of, of something positive, right? The Fairbanks, a fascinating study of military and the university, the direct effect, and then all the multiplier effects, all that that supports in terms of retail jobs, construction, everything in Fairbanks it depends to some degree on those things. Um, but multiplier effects work in reverse too. So if you, if you were to lift those things out of Fairbanks, not immediately, but the, the consequence of that would ripple through the economy and lots of things not, that you may not think are associated directly with the military, the university, would, would eventually be affected, and in, in fairly short order. Um, so just to illustrate that, at one end of the spectrum, imagine a, a, an income tax on somebody who works at a remote work site, non-resident, so they, they, they uh, collect their, their check and go home. Not a lot of multiplier effect when that, when that money comes to the state. They weren't spending a lot of that money in the state anyway. At, at the other, other end of the spectrum, we've got something like the PFD, especially for low-income households. We know we see in our numbers, which are job numbers, better numbers would be sales numbers. There's, October's Christmas in Alaska. That money gets spent. So that has a larger multiplier. When that comes out, you create uh, more in terms of, uh, of a whole than if you do some of the other things. Uh, this, this, this instability is a, is a we're, we're, we're experiencing some of that right now, and we'll, we'll come back to this topic. But what instability does, it, it creates extra costs, and it discourages investment. Um, some of the extra costs, imagine um, insurance costs, lots of extra potential costs. And, and if you're unsure, we saw a lot of this nationally with the Great Recession. People were reluctant to make big decisions especially. You want to wait and see. You want to wait until you're sure you're going to have a job next month before you buy a house. Lots of things like that. So, so instability is one of the, the, the broad things to keep in mind. Uh, I couldn't resist. I, I was just so starved for a graph because this is usually the, the bulk of what, what we produce. So, and I, I think this is relevant. This is the 1980s um, job numbers. So, um, and, and the point here is not to look very specifically at the 1980s. The point, as my title suggests, th this, this demonstrates um, multiplier effects and economic instability. Um, we lost, from 1985 to 1986, more than 5,000 construction jobs. Over the course of those two years in the red, we lost 3,400 retail sector jobs. We lost 2,500 government jobs. Those things weren't directly related to the oil crash and the, the uh, the uh, housing uh, problems, the bank closures, but they were downstream related. Um, a couple of other things just to note, that growth in the early 80s was really out there, 10% in 1981, really strong growth. And there's no really um, specific point about that other than to say, since I've been doing this at the Department of Labor, the, the highest growth we've had is 1.8% in 2005. Um, the, the losses were four, five percent. The highest, the biggest losses we've had, 0.4% in 2008 during the Great Recession, which um, we described that as a, it was a glancing blow for us. It didn't, it didn't do a whole lot to us. But we all felt that. So it gives you some scale of what happened in the 80s. And then something people forget, potentially, or, or occasionally we hear, we kind of roared out of that recession, which was, I mean, that's strong growth uh, in 1980. Nine, even 1988, 3,600 jobs. It's been quite a few years since we've added that many jobs in a single year with a much bigger base. Uh, so, before we're going to we're going to look at some basic pros and cons of some of the some of the options you're familiar with that Commissioner Hofbeck talked about in, in much more detail. But uh, keep these two things in mind. We have. So these really powerful, this one especially big powerful tool that really would be the envy of other states. Um, that's part of what makes this problem solvable, uh, a big part. Another one is that, is that and this, you've heard this uh, yesterday from Gunner, you heard it this morning from Pat Pitney, every other state except New Hampshire 
relies heavily, not just relies, relies heavily on either a state sales tax or a state income tax. New Hampshire is kind of fun. They have a statewide property tax and some, some income taxes that are, that are uh, kind of special. But, and, and just to reinforce that point, here's the graph again. Gray or blue. Gray is uh, individual income tax. Blue is general sales taxes. So you see there's, there's us in New Hampshire, the only ones that don't rely heavily on one of those two things. I'm not saying that that's what we should do, just that, that other states have done what we are thinking about doing. Uh, we're not, this is not a really unsolvable problem. So let's look just specifically, and this is, this is meant to be very wide angle. When we talk state income tax, uh, one of the pros obviously brings new money into the economy to the extent it taxes non-residents. Um, we have, and that 20% of all workers, that's workers, and that's by the PFD definition of residency. So that's on the high side. That's not 20% of the income that's paid. So, so be careful not to think that, that we can get 20% of, of, uh, of that, uh, some pot from non-residents. That would be exaggerated. But that is an important piece. We're not taxing that income. And that's, like we saw in the previous slide, that's fairly unusual. Most states, if you work there, you pay an income tax, whether you live there or not. Um, so the other thing, uh, lower multiplier than some options. And then the other thing, deductible on federal income taxes. It, uh, a lot of, a lot of it's, it's, it's different, different places, but to some degree, the amount you pay in state income tax is usually deductible in your federal income tax. So that's money that would have gone to the federal government that's now coming to Alaska. Uh, this lower multiplier, we'll talk a little bit about that. When you, uh, um, so that's a pro here in terms of the amount of money we take from Alaskans. We take some out, but uh, to the extent we take it from higher income Alaskans, they tend to spend a little bit less of it. So it's, it's a little bit of a lower multiplier. We won't uh, belabor that point. This bottom one is almost um, circular that, well, yeah, you reduce Alaska's household disposable income by definition, and income tax takes some income. But, but you are, the, part of the point of that is we are moving money around as opposed to infusing more money into the economy broadly. State sales tax, same, same basic pro, we bring mo money, new money into the state to the extent the spending is done by non-residents. Uh, both uh, state income and states are fairly stable and extremely stable compared to what um, we have become accustomed to um, in terms of uh, how, how wide the fluctuations can be with oil and gas. Uh, the cons, Commissioner Hoffbeck touched on this, many local governments already have sales tax. Also, um, relatively high multiplier because sales taxes uh, tend to hit, uh, lower income households spend a higher percentage of their income, so, uh, you, you take a little bit more mon money out of the economy when you uh, go for sales tax. Uh, permanent fund earnings. This one is interesting. Uh, significant revenue potential have you seen? We've, we've got this, this big pot. Not saying we should spend it right now, but, but, but it's big enough that the earnings are large, potentially. Uh, could be a very stable source of revenue depending on how it's structured. Um, Let's see, and then uh, obviously the con is that, that when you start to spend even the earnings, then we, we don't reinvest that and it doesn't continue to grow and then the, the possibilities for spending off even more money in the future are out there. Um, so the permanent fund dividend itself, also large, um, 1.3 billion, I think uh, Gunnar said yesterday. Uh, again, uh, like with the sales tax, larger impact on lower income Alaskans. And, um, rural Alaskans especially, there are, there are parts of the state that uh, don't have very much in terms of cash economies. Um, so this would hit some of those places especially hard. Um, and again, not a, not a value conversation or a fairness conversation here, but just uh, to the extent that money goes and is spent, uh, it leaves a bigger hole when you remove it. Uh, So oil tax increases, I deliberately put this one towards the end. Obviously, this could, we could talk about this forever, and, 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 and I think there will be lots of conversation about this. But, but it's uh, very broadly, 
the pros, it, it's, it's a very large amount of money that gets generated because of our oil resource. And the con, uh, you, you tax something, you affect the, uh, the balance. Maybe at the margins, maybe, uh, maybe the margins matter, and, and you, but you, can, you do affect behavior. And, and when tax structure move, taxes move around a lot, you also affect baby. That's, that's, you're, you're injecting some uncertainty into the investment decisions. So the miscellaneous other, very interesting. I, I was fascinated to hear about lotteries and, and the white paper from Department of Revenue is, is excellent, talking about some really fun history about how far this goes back. Um, the, and so I've just put them all together. The pro, uh, it adds some diversity, and diversity of, of almost anything usually tends to create a little more stability. Uh, the con, that all of those things combined um, get us about $200 million. So we're not, we're not uh, solving the big problem here. We're, we're helping solve the big problem here. So uh, final thoughts, and um, this touching again on the idea that uh, that this is a, a problem with a, with some solutions that uh, won't we won't have to we won't have to um, you know uh, invent something really fancy to solve this. We have significant economic assets, and, and what I've put up here mostly are things that we offer to the to the global marketplace. Um, uh, Scott Goldsmith talks and writes eloquently about the three-legged stool. You've heard about that, oil federal government, and all of their basic sectors. The, the other basic sectors, uh, fishing, uh, our fish resource, uh, tourism, uh, uh, air cargo is one, that we, we bring money into the economy by having that strategic location that, that brings some of that. Timber used to be a, a significant one, not so much now. But these things, uh, th this, is, this is a lot to, to build an economy on. Um, and the bottom one I'll just mention, uh, we have a more mature service sector than we used to. So that means that the money that we do bring in circulates a little bit more. So maybe in 1980, if you need a dialysis or a neurosurgeon, you, you go to Seattle. Now maybe you stay in Anchorage or, or go to Fairbanks. Um, lots of examples along those lines. Um, and, and, but th this basic sector idea, we, we sometimes think about it of, of engines on a plane um, and you can't afford to lose an engine or two. We've got uh, some really big engines that we really can't afford to lose. Um, and and I, as I was putting this together, I, I thought, if, if people read the things that we produce, we produce Alaska Economic Trends every month, you read a lot about healthcare. I thought, that's, I, thought I wonder if anyone will say, where's, where's healthcare on this? Keep, healthcare is, a, is not a basic sector. Uh, construction is not a basic sector. Those things are the body of the plane or something else. So those things depend on, on uh, and they are, they are a key part of that bottom bullet, but that, that allows us to keep more mo that, that money here. But, but the, the basic sectors require a special, I think, uh, special attention. Um, and in a way, I kind of like uh, the idea of a motor because you have to pay attention to a motor. A leg on a stool, you know, it's, it's pretty good. Um, <laughs> tracks. <laughs> All right. So, uh, finally, we, we, we do some forecasting, and in other states, the forecasting that the people who, who do what I do do gets a lot of attention because of state income taxes. What we say we think is going to happen affects revenue forecasting. In Alaska, we kind of toil in obscurity because the oil revenue forecasting is what matters as, it, as it's appropriate. Um, but, but we do that, and in, in thinking about that, if, if I'm forecasting, then then the biggest risk I see is that we will, we will create unnecessary costs, right? We're gonna have some costs, we know that. But, uh, but, but if, we, if we dither or if we disagree, democracy's messy, we all know that. But, but we, there's some risk there that, that will we'll create some costs that, that may not be necessary. Uh, and, then, and then this other one, uh, confidence. If, if you paid attention during the national recession or uh, uh, to our uh, 1980s experience, you know how much confidence matters. Somebody's condo didn't go from being worth $150,000 to $20,000 because the price of the materials changed. It, it went from that value to the, to the lower value because people didn't think they could get a buyer because it's, that's what people were willing to pay for it. So confidence is very important to an economy. And, 
and having big looming economic issues that aren't being addressed will affect uh, consumer confidence and business confidence and bond ratings confidence. One of the reasons, if you read uh, Fitch or Standard & Poor's, they talk about we have a uh, large rainy day accounts. That's part of what makes us low risk. Uh, that could change, obviously. So, so it's, it's worth paying attention to that uh, as, as part of the puzzle. And that's all I have. Thank you very much.